Okay, hello everyone and welcome to ESMARConf 2022 and the special session number eight, Developing the Synthesis Community. As always, this session is being live streamed to YouTube and the individual presentations have been pre-recorded and published on YouTube as well. Subtitles have been verified and can be auto-translated. For those uh, individual talks, automatic subtitles will be available shortly for this live stream. If you have questions for our presenters, you can ask them via the presenter's individual tweet um, from the e at Esh Hackathon Twitter account, um, which is also on the slide here. Presenters may have time after their talks to answer some of the questions or at the end of the session if time allows. We will endeavor to answer all questions soon after the event. We would also like to remind you of our code of conduct, which is available on our website um, at github.io. Um, so now I would like to introduce you to our first presenter, uh, Wolfgang Bickbauer from Maastricht University. Wolfgang, you're on. All right, just a second. All right, here we go. So my name is Wolfgang Fischbauer from Maastricht University in the Netherlands, and I will be presenting on the Metadata package a collection of meta-analysis data sets for R. So one of the nice things about published meta-analyses is that they often, not always, but often, include the full data set that was used for the analysis. So for example, down here, you see table one from the meta-analysis by Kolditz and Kalix on the effectiveness of the BCG vaccine against tuberculosis. So for each of the included studies, you have the number of uh, participants that were vaccinated, those that were in the control group, and the number of TB cases in each of these groups, based on which you can compute an effect size measure and then conduct a meta-analysis. So by going to meta-analyses, we can actually build up a whole collection of meta-analytic data sets. So you do not have to go back to the primary studies and extract the information from those, which would be really tedious and time consuming. Somebody has already done this. And if you're lucky, you can find the data set in a table or maybe in an appendix, and then we can put it into our database. And why is this useful? Well, for various purposes, for teaching purposes, for illustrating or testing methods, for validating the analyses that were conducted and for sensitivity checks. So what you see here is the BCG data set as it was included in the metaphor package. So again, we have the studies and we have the same information that was in this table one, except that instead of the number of cases and the group sizes, we have the number of cases and non-cases in the treated or the vaccinated group and the same for the control group, but this is essentially the same information. So then we can compute the same effect size measure that was used in the meta-analysis by Kolditz and colleagues, these risk ratios or more specifically log risk ratios. So now we have those in our data set and the corresponding variances. Then we can pass this information to a modeling function like the RMA function from the metaphor package and um, conduct a random effects model meta-analysis. Here I use the DL, the De Simone and Laird estimator because that is also what was used by Kolditz and Karnix. So we get these results. I'm not gonna discuss these, that's not the focus here. We can back transform the estimated average log risk ratio into an average risk ratio. And here we have this estimate. So on average, vaccinated individuals have about half of the risk as the, those in the control groups with a corresponding confidence interval. And then we can compare these results to what was given in the meta-analysis. And we see that this matches up exactly. So we are able to reproduce the findings or the, the results from the coded set our meta-analysis. In addition to this, we can conduct some sensitivity analyses. So again, here are the results that we just looked at, but we could maybe use the mental Hansel method, which is a fixed effects model, or use one of these binomial normal models or various Bayesian models. For example, here are the results from the base meta package that we heard about yesterday. 
So we can compare these results, see how different or similar they are, and essentially do a sensitivity analysis. So over the years, I've included more and more data sets like this in the metaphor package. Each of these dots is a release of the metaphor package. So over time, you can see that the number of data sets keeps going up and eventually I got to around 60 data sets. At a certain point though, the idea arose of moving these data sets into a separate data package. Why? Well, it would make it easier to add data sets even without updating the metaphor package itself. And the code in the metaphor package might not change, but you might want to add some data sets. And also then it would be maybe a bit easier for others to contribute data sets. It might seem a bit more daunting to make a contribution to metaphor instead, if there's a data package, then this is maybe a bit easier to make a contribution. So we started working on this on this at the 2019 Evidence Synthesis Hackathon. So to, together with Thomas, Emily, Daniel, Alistair, and Kyle, and then eventually we released the first version on CRAN two years later. So there was a bit of a delay for various reasons, but eventually we got it out there. So here's the link to the CRAN page. The development is running over GitHub as everybody does. You can read the documentation nicely formatted online using the package down package and the, the uh, metadata package now includes 79 data sets. The data sets all have a consistent naming scheme. So they're called dot period, then author. So the first author of the meta-analysis from which the data set was extracted and the publication year. And these data sets are all documented in a consistent manner. So you have a general description of the data set description of each variable included in the data set, details about the data set or the meta-analysis, the source of the data. So that's typically a publication from which the data were extracted. Maybe some other relevant references in case the data set has been used in other publications. Then the person who extracted the data. So in case you do find a discrepancy between the published data and what's in metadata, you know who to contact and then examples illustrating the use of the data. And this may even be a full blown replication of all of the analyses conducted in the original meta-analysis and then some concept terms. So what are these concept terms? Each data set is tagged with one or multiple of them and they may pertain to the field or the topic of this meta-analysis. You see some examples here. Um, they may also describe the outcome measure used. So you have meta-analyses using correlation coefficients or as we saw earlier, risk ratios and maybe standardized mean differences. And then also the types of methods that were used in the, the meta-analysis or that can be illustrating with it, illustrated with the data set. So for example, cluster robust inference or multivariate models, network meta-analysis, there are some data sets with some outliers. So this is quite interesting to look at, or maybe data sets that can be used to illustrate publication bias or evidence for that. So these concept terms are really useful to find data sets that you might find interesting, but of course they need to be used consistently across all of these data sets. And if you make changes to concept terms, well, that's a bit tedious because then you have to go back through all of the existing data sets and make sure that they are tagged accordingly. And under this link, you can find a listing of all the concept terms that have been used so far. If you just want to see the data sets included, well, you can do this here with this command, or you can go to this link. So let me just click on this just to show you, right? So you have all these data sets, and then, well, you can take a look at them. So again, description, the format, some details, the source, maybe another reference related to this, who extracted the data set, these concept terms, and then examples illustrating the use of this data set. You can also search for data sets. The package includes the dot search function which allows you to search based on the concept terms by default or a full text search of these help files. So for example, if you want to find data sets 
tagged with standardized mean differences or maybe multiple key terms, odds ratios, multi-level, or if you want to do a full text search, well, then you just set concept equal false, and then these help files will be searched uh, based on their full text. What we also want, and this is really one of the most important aspects here, is for people to contribute their data sets to the package. So we have set up a pretty detailed workflow of how, how this should go. So how can you contribute your own data set if you have done a meta-analysis and you would like to include it in the metadata package? Um, and there are some guiding principles here. So first of all, we want these data sets to be named in a consistent manner. We also make a distinction between the raw data and the data set that is actually included in the package. Meta-analytic data sets are often large, not so much in terms of the number of rows, but the number of columns. Often you extract a lot of information about the studies included in a meta-analysis. And not all of these variables might be so interesting for inclusion in the data set that goes into metadata. So there's the raw data set that might have been um, extracted from an appendix, and then there is a data preparation script that takes this raw data set and turns it into maybe a slightly cleaned or condensed version of the data set that actually goes into the metadata package. And in addition, we wrote a function that helps people to document their data set. So what this function does is it creates a template for the help file. Not everybody is familiar with how to write these RD files. And this function will set up a template that you just need to complete then. So that's pretty straightforward. So once you have put together all these files, you have the raw data file, the data preparation script that creates the R data file and the help file, you can either just make a pull request via GitHub if you're familiar with the Git workflow or just send us the files and we'll be happy to include them in the package. So at this year's conference, we also were running a little hackathon um, along the way. And so what was the goal of this hackathon? Well, we wanted to create a shiny app. Everybody's creating shiny apps these days. So we also wanted to, we also want a shiny app. And what does this app do or what should it do? It should sort of replicate what that search does, but in a shiny way, right? In a slightly fancier, more interactive way. And the hackathon was also an opportunity to add some additional data sets, maybe improve the documentation, think about additional functionality. And I'll be happy to uh, report on the outcomes of this hackathon at the next, uh, at the closing session. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. I want to thank my collaborators um, on the package, all the people who have already made contributions to, to the metadata package. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, I'd be happy to hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang, for a really um, fantastic presentation and package. And we, we do look forward to hearing about the updates um, during the closing session today. Um, we are going to um, hold off on questions until after all the presenters have gone. So um, don't forget to send us your questions on YouTube or by Twitter. Um, and right now, we're going to head over to our next presenter. Um, Mark Lejeunesse, who is uh, coming to us from the University of South Florida. So, um, Mark, you're on. Hi, um, I'm Mark Lejeunesse, and um, forgive me for the candid presentation here, but I'm really going to talk about three lessons I learned about trying to get undergraduates involved in screening studies for systematic reviews or meta-analysis. Um, I've also tried to use them to uh, help classify things for uh, test data sets for machine learning projects. Um, and, and I'll just flat out say that it's not a straightforward endeavor as you could imagine. Um, but what I wanna start with is uh, what's my motivation for doing this in the first place? And every year or every semester, I get really, really excited when I'm standing in front of an auditorium of potentially hundreds of students thinking about, oh, how could I leverage this situation 
into a scenario where I could uh, steal all their energy to uh, code, classify, screen, many, many, many studies for uh, <laughs> systematic reviews. And, uh, and so I have tried this for about eight semesters now. I'm doing one right now uh, for my parasitology course. And, um, and so I'm gonna try to describe a little bit some of the challenges that I face when uh, getting so many students involved in, in this process. Um, and maybe most importantly, how I fall flat every semester in achieving high quality <laughs> uh, screening decisions uh, by these students. And oh boy, let's just uh, jump into it. Let me talk a little bit about the, uh, the population of screeners. Um, in general, they are undergraduates. They can range from their first year at the university straight out of high school to seniors. They've been around for four or five years. And so you could, right there, you know that there's a variation in um, confidence and experience with science. And of course, anyone who's ever tried to uh, embark in a screening uh, project, um, you really need to understand uh, the language involved in um, how science is uh, reported and summarized. And so uh, the first challenge is uh, undergraduates tend to vary quite a bit in their um, expertise or um, I wouldn't say interest, but their confidence in, in making uh, screening decisions. Uh, the range of classrooms that I've experimented with, and this, these are not formal experiments, these are just me getting excited each semester, trying to get students involved, is they range from about 40 to 200 students. And it doesn't matter the size or the number of students involved. Um, really, the challenge is um, making sense of uh, what they screen and what they achieve. Now, the last thing I, I want to discuss is uh, the number of studies that I've attempted to uh, screen or classify or code with uh, these students. And I haven't been overly ambitious with this. I, it's usually about 300 to 2,000 studies. And the reason I'm not super ambitious, like when you have 200 people ready to go, um, it really almost makes it impossible for me to verify um, the uh, decisions they make. And so if I, we go super ambitious and try to screen 10,000 studies, then um, in terms of quality control, uh, that makes it very inefficient for me to um, proceed with other phases in a research synthesis project because I have to verify and check and uh, make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of making good decisions to screen, to exclude, include studies for systematic review. So let's begin. Here is my first lesson I learned uh, by using hundreds of undergraduates to try to screen studies. Dual screening designs really do not make sense in this scenario. Now, a typical dual screening design is you have two reviewers screen the same collection of studies, and then you use, a, say, a kappa statistic to uh, assess consistency uh, between the reviewers in how they agree or disagree with what should be included or excluded. This really breaks down when you have hundreds of students because the paired design is not adequate enough to create high quality repeatable decisions. And the reason for that is not all students are on the same page or at the same level of making the screening decisions. No matter how much work I put into it to prepping them, you know, getting them ready with uh, using some sort of PICO framework of trying to answer questions when they're screening the title and abstract, there's always a cohort of studies of students, I mean, that are just not, not making um, effective decisions. And, and because we tend to approach the screening process as part of a project, we have many phases to go through in a semester. And so I really don't have much time to 
train them and test them over and over and over again to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So the dual screening stuff really doesn't work because what you end up happening is having to uh, drop entire clusters of poorly um, graded kappa statistics, collections of studies that there were just complete inconsistency in um, screening decisions, um, which makes the whole process again inefficient because you gotta, we have to revise and review these things over and over again. And when I first started this, I would repeat that process three, four times, right? So what would just typically be one screening bout would snowball into a second and a third screening bout, just a double, triple check screening decisions. And so now I kind of converged on a totally different approach where I'm not evaluating um, groups based on consistency. I evaluate individual studies on consistency. And so what I do is I take a random sample of the students, say about 20 students in a class, and they each independently evaluate a single study. And that becomes my measure of a decision consistency is kind of like this sampling experiment where I'm having many, many, many students evaluate the same title and abstract for inclusion and exclusion. And then if the uh, statistic, the consistency statistic is uh, high, then it probably means that there is, it's valid to be included or excluded. This leads me to my second lesson. And this one is by far the one I have the most trouble with at all. And um, I, I'm gonna need some time to explain this because I, it's not at all intuitive. Um, there, there tends to be a trend of high consistency in what to include when screening studies, right? Students agree very highly on what to include. What has the most variability or variation in screening decisions is on what to exclude. And in an ideal scenario, right? There, the probability of inclusion and exclusion um, should be similar. Uh, however, here in this case, what we have is students really hesitate and, and are uh, challenged with making exclusion decisions. And so uh, forgive this uh, cloud of data points, but this is, the, this is the nature of using undergraduates for screening decisions. Each axis here represents a, um, two bouts of screening decisions on the same studies. So one week we screened 250 studies, the other week, we rescreened those 250 studies. Each point here is the, um, is the uh, repeatability statistic of making a decision on whether or not to include or exclude an individual study. So each point here is an individual study and about 20 students made decisions on whether or not to include or exclude that study. So based on two bouts of the same studies, you can see there's a lot of noise, right? Even though they're doing the same thing over again, uh, the uh, decisions are not highly repeatable. You can fit a line through this and there is a correlation between the two. Uh, but the important thing to uh, emphasize here is that there's high agreement in what to include between two separate bouts, but um, there's a lot of noise associated with excluding the studies. And so, you know, even though the PICO statement is very useful in making decisions on what uh, criteria you want to hit on when you're reading a title and abstract, it doesn't really help you much with making a decision on what to exclude, especially if you're not fully confident in reading and understanding scientific sum summaries. An abstract is a very um, unusual type of writing, right? It's concise, it's short. It tends to be uh, way more dense in jargon sometimes because you got to squeeze in as much information as you can in a small amount of space. This actually makes it, I feel like, makes it more difficult for undergraduates to read and understand what's happening, especially when we're trying to do a research synthesis project. This leads me to my final um, challenge or lesson learned. And I, this is by far the dimension that I've experimented the most with. 
it, again, informal experiments, <laughs> is uh, the tools will break. I mean, when you have 200 students and they're using their phones, they're using maybe their parents' computer, maybe they're using computers at the library to do screening decisions, that inconsistency is, uh, makes it difficult to, um, on my end, to make sense of uh, what they achieve. So throughout the years, I've experimented with many, many different things. I started off with using um, um, our generated HTML forms uh, that populate uh, Google spreadsheets. But what happens with that is not all browsers are friendly or open to um, form fillable things. And because people are using their phones and different tools to uh, navigate, to browse the HTML files, um, this creates a lot of hiccups when assignments are due. And usually there's like a cohort of students who are having problems submitting their screening decisions uh, because the, there's a, like a technology issue going on there. Other approaches I've used are uh, PDFs. So again, you generate a collection of PDFs in R, they're form fillable, fantastic. However, once the PDFs are in the hands of students, they're using different applications to, um, to uh, read these things. And, uh, and then when they save their effort, um, it's in a totally different format. And when it ends up in my hands, that results in a bunch of implementation issues because PDFs are by far the hardest files to crack open and mine information, especially form fillable data, because depending on the application you use to save the form, uh, the things that populate the forms, it may be in a totally different format and R is not really set up to process uh, variations in form fillable out, uh, decisions. So what I've converged on now, and it's really just this a ridiculous acrobatics is I use Canvas, which is the software they use to uh, take exams, watch lectures, all that stuff. And I bamboozle it for uh, synthesis projects. And so basically in R, what I do is I take a CSV file of abstracts and titles. I convert it to a, I always forget what the file name is. I got it written right here, a uh, QTI format, which is the only way Canvas accepts uh, questions. And I um, convert the quizzes that they take online into uh, screening, uh, screening decision uh, technology. This is by far the most efficient way for me to do stuff, even though it's harder for me to implement. It's easy for them to do because they have to use Canvas for all of their lectures. And when they're done their assignment, they could forget about it. And I get it in a semi-convenient, consistent way where I don't have to worry about differences in how they saved their outcomes or how they submitted their outcomes. Everything is somewhat consistent. Although, personally, it is a ridiculous endeavor. So, um, there's many places to go with this. And I feel like um, maybe the greatest inroads could be technology-wise in putting things in the hands of students that are uh, straightforward and simple to make uh, screening coding decisions. Um, that is not that is independent from what they use to uh, make decisions and how they submit their decisions. And I know there's a lot of neat resources out there to do this, but I feel like they tend to be targeted towards uh, researchers, people with a lot of experience in making decisions, a lot of experience with technology. Um, and this, these tools don't quite fit an undergraduate who is probably 5% committed to the course, realistically, right? So they have like five courses going at once. They have their professors forcing them to do screening decisions. I mean, what we have to do is streamline that whole process to make it as simple and straightforward as possible for them. So that's it. I like to end it at that. Um, these are some of the lessons I learned. There's certainly more, um, <laughs> more things that I've learned, um, but I'm, I, I'm doing a shout out here. I have many ideas on how to do this, but it'd be fantastic if I could collaborate and, and figure this out, crack this nut with 
many other people rather than me just doing this on my own. I guess I what I'm bringing forward is experience and um, and uh, expertise in uh, not successfully implementing this strategy for screening studies. And so again, there's a, a lot of room to grow. And I think I'll end it at that. Um, thank you for watching. Thanks, Mark. Um, that was a fantastic presentation and just really highlighted some of the challenges that I've even come across in my own experience. Um, but I haven't actually nailed down to those, you know, three issues the way you have. And I'm so glad that you brought it to the hackathon because this is, um, I think, the perfect group to, to try to work towards those challenges. So hopefully when we do the Q&A, um, there'll be lots of time to talk about that further. Um, thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to our last presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce David Hobby and Alexander Bannock brown um, Both are at the Berlin Institute of Health, um, and they'll be going next. I'm David Hobby from Kamaradis Berlin, based at the Quest Center of the Berlin Institute of Health. I'm going to discuss a web app that we have built for teaching meta-analysis in R. Kamaradis Berlin is a group located at the Charité Health Network in Berlin for the promotion of the benefits of systematic review and meta-analysis of animal studies. Kamaradis stands for Collaborative Approach to Meta-Analysis and Review of Animal Data from Experimental Studies and is part of an international network of preclinical researchers. We do our own research, and we also provide methodological support for researchers to perform robust, high-quality reviews. One of the ways we do this is by... Um, sorry, everyone, it looks like we're just having a problem with um, the uh, presentation on our end. It'll just be a, a minute while we sort that out. R using the metaphor and meta packages. During the pandemic, the tech hurdles, which have always been present when teaching this material, have been exacerbated by the remote learning framework. Most of the participants in our workshops come from disciplines such as biomedical and medical research or epidemiology and are generally not familiar with programming languages or statistical programming software. In previous iterations of the course, we would provide an R script and some CSV data files, lay out the technical requirements in advance with the expectation that all required software be installed and functional on session day. However, some subset of the participants would often arrive without having read the requirements or installing R or the required packages or with out of date or conflicting packages. This often turned the first hour or hours of the course into a troubleshooting session where we would have to go around and figure out what was going on with each individual person who's having issues. In light of this issue, we had the idea to build a self-contained web app based on the Learn R package, which walks the user through the steps to recreate the analyses of a published meta-analysis of animal data in the biomedical field involving a comparison of controlled intervention studies affecting infarct volume. This publication used all of the medical and analytical methods which we would like to teach, namely random and fixed effect models, meta-regressions, and visualizations of heterogeneity with study design characteristics, forest and bubble plots. The two R meta-analysis packages which we used, Meta and Metaphor, contain the necessary functions for performing these analyses. In order to present these uh, this analyses in a useful way, we also used two additional packages. These packages were Shiny and Learn R. Shiny is a package for the creation of interactive web apps in R, which when combined with Learn R, allows R markdown documents to be converted into interactive tutorials with live code exercises. Here, for example, is one code chunk taken from section one of our app, where the user is asked to examine a data set that was just loaded. When you click run code, the code is executed and the output is displayed in the browser. After each major section, we also have questions with quizzes to check for understanding with immediate feedback. So if you get the wrong answer, you can try again until you get it right. In section five, 
Participants are asked to create their own code based on what they have learned from the preceding sections in order to answer a set of questions. If they get stuck, the hint button will point them in the right direction. Other features that can be implemented in Learn R and Shiny are embedded videos and interactive Shiny elements. We actually didn't use either of these in the current iteration of the app, but it could be possible in the future. Using a teaching app allows us to sidestep any software associated problems that individual students may have. So we can focus on the actual material and on the principles of meta-analysis. The app runs in a browser window, which means that from the student's perspective, it is an interactive website. The course is presented as a step-by-step -step tutorial with interactive code exercises, which walk the student from loading the data through to performing the final analyses. At each step, there are short quizzes to check comprehension. Progress is saved as the user progresses through the app so that they can leave and come back whenever they want. All code is run on our own server, and we make sure that all packages are up to date to ensure full functionality. This does, however, present its own issues on our side. The biggest issue we've had is the performance. Our courses have between 10 and 35 participants, which means an instance of R running on our server for each participant. And even with lower numbers of participants, we have had slowdowns and crashes when everyone is running analyses at once. Secondly, some participants reported that the user interface is still quite unintuitive and could be streamlined. One of the sections in particular is very long and it is difficult to tell how far you are through it. We could probably break this up to make it more intuitive. We welcome other feedback about the app in general and the user experience in order to improve it. The biggest benefit and the primary goal of using this approach is that we have had zero technical issues on the participant side since we have been using the app. The lowered barrier of entry for those students without prior experience or pro exposure to programming languages, and we have received generally positive feedback from our students about it, with the majority reporting that it was easy to use for the purposes of our tutorial. We provide access to the tutorial 24-7 on our website, which means participants can access the access the tutorial at any time and review the material. It is accessible to anyone else who may have interest. It was developed collaboratively via GitHub using free and open source software. And lastly, it has been shared with other Camarades locations. Our colleagues in Edinburgh are also using the app in their tutorials and they are able to run it on their own server after downloading it from GitHub. So the app is not yet in its final form. The next steps are firstly to optimize server usage to improve performance when many users are running it. We've already optimized caching and we are investigating methods of parallelization. This will reduce and hopefully prevent the slowdowns and crashes that we have experienced so far. Secondly, we're gonna clean up the user interface to make it easier and more intuitive to walk through. The one very long section that I mentioned earlier could easily be broken up into at least two uh, other sections as a starting point. We don't want to remove any material. We believe it is important to present the full analysis from the published paper, but we could definitely arrange it in a more digestible way. Lastly, we would like to refine the questions and provide more in-depth feedback as to why answers are correct or incorrect. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank everyone on the Camarades Berlin team and would like to thank our funders at the Charité 3R department as well as the developers of Meta, Metaphor, Shiny, and Learn R packages for making this project possible. And again, we welcome any feedback regarding the app or the experience, and I'm looking forward to the discussion and questions coming through on Twitter. Thank you, David and Alexandra, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and you know, I'm delighted to say that um, we have all the presenters here for live questions. So please send your questions through on Twitter. Um, if the presenters could um, turn on their videos and microphones, we'd love to see your faces. Um, I, I think I'm just gonna get a uh, question started um, for, for Mark, it's from Neil Hadaway. Um, so this, this is actually a question that um, I, I had a similar kind of question about crowdsourcing. Um, and so the question is, should we be gamifying the screening experience for crowds that are involved in, in reviews um, as opposed to kind of coordinators managing the projects? Do you think that would be a good <laughs> solution? This is, this is 
exactly what I'm up to is, is really it's gamifying in that, you know, you're using a bunch of non-experts to make decisions on what to include, exclude. And uh, I'd say maybe it's passable. Like I, I have not succeeded <laughs> with it. The idea is to get a lot of eyes on a single study. And like the dual screening, you just have two people making decisions. That's totally inadequate. I mean, as far as I could tell, 20 plus uh, kind of washes out the few screeners, the few uh, reviewers that really have no clue what decisions they're making. Um, and it's just, should we do this? I think if we could process, if you have, if you have the capacity to have many people screen a single study, then I think it's probably okay. Um, the challenge is like, you're wasting a lot of effort there and that now a single study gets a lot of attention, but if you have thousands, then you, it's a, it's a distribution problem on making screening decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Great point there about, uh, resource waste, right? Um, Wolfgang, I see your hand up and then we'll go to Alexandra as well. Yes. So, uh, Mark, very interesting, uh, I really like this idea. Um, so in, in meta-analyses, we often worry about dependencies these days, right? Uh, big topic. So how do you, how do you avoid that uh, students are sort of getting together and doing the coding together and then you get dependent uh, codes? Well, okay, so uh, every student gets a random collection of studies. And so maybe two students have 20 students out of 100 class will get the same study, but how do you coordinate that, right? And so maybe, well, I do have an open discussion board for difficult situations and students typically vote to make a decision on whether or not to include, exclude. But yeah, you're right. So there is, there is that challenge, but as far as I know, it doesn't really happen because um, again, students have like 30, 30 titles, abstracts to screen, it's a totally random collection from the sample population to screen. And so they don't have, like in a dual screening design, you have two people with the same collection. They can coordinate. Uh, but when it's a complete random sample, then coordinating for individual studies, I think would be really tough for them to, to manage. Although, who knows? <laughs> Alexandra? Um. Great presentation. Thanks, Mark. I just wanted to share some experience that we've had with um, crowdsourced meta research projects um, on work that, that's been published. Um, we have um, used pre-training. Um, so reviewers that want to be involved in the project need to pass some level of training um, before to, to check comprehension of things like the PICO or, or, or that kind of thing. A, a platform like Learn R could be used to, to do that. The Learn R functions, um, yeah, it can record how many people have uh, passed, not passed. You're not able to move to the next section until you do pass it, things like that. Um, and you can also download it as an instructor. You can download class results and individual student results as well. Um, I think it's really interesting, your, your dilemma um, about kind of randomly presenting articles or not for screening. Um, and one of the, the um, software that we use randomly presents the articles for title and abstract screening. Um, and we have it set at um, two kind of uh, agreed decisions. So that's um, whether there's three people involved or whether two people initially um, kind of agree already. And those just kind of get presented in random order. You could also increase it to say that, you know, five people need to agree in order to make that decision um, and to that paper included or excluded, um, playing around with, um, yeah, how many screeners is required for a paper to be included. Yeah, the, the challenge I face is, you know, because things aren't pairwise anymore, um, you, instead of it being like a binary include exclude, now I have like a, a proportion, right? That can range from, you know, uh, minus one to one. And that's what basically this cloud is, right? It's like 20 students on this individual study right here, uh, on average made a decision to include it. And so what I do is like, I kind of convert this into space. If you occupy this space here, 
then the study gets included. If you occupy this space, uh, the study gets excluded. And if you occupy either of these uh, competing or complementary spaces, uh, the whole studies get re reviewed again, which again, totally inefficient. Sounds like a really complex algorithm. We, we usually work with three screeners and then the agreement has to be above 66%, but with 20, 20 plus screeners, that seems like. <laughs> well, okay, here's the even, even weirder thing that I did not talk about is the way this is done is the number of screeners assigned per study is also random. So you could have up to 10 to 50 students screen the same study. Despite the challenge, I feel like I need to like um, collaborate and harness some of your student power because it would be fantastic <laughs> to have um, this this body of <laughs> students that are kind well, of willing to do this work. That's why I get excited every semester. I'm like, holy smokes, folks, let's do some science. Let's push push things forward. But then, you know, not everyone is motivated. Not everyone is like committed. You know, everyone's exciting at the beginning of the semester, but when the semester's near ending and they have to worry about exams and all that stuff, they really don't want to be spending time screening studies. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, Alexander, you're... Sorry, I just have another question on, on that point. Um, I wonder how much, I mean, I don't know how you've set up your course about how much this contributes to, to class credit. Um, but something that's worked really well for us in crowdsource projects in the past is having a leaderboard that's like updated live. So who's done the most screening, who's contrib you know, done contributed, and people are naturally really competitive. Um, so that works really well for us. I, I do that when we reach the stage of finding research articles where um, it ends up being a, just a giant competition of who could find PDFs of certain things. And, and if something does not get done, like a student does not submit their papers on time, then that effort gets distributed as bonus points for the class as a bounty to get things done. Yeah, I, I love all this stuff again, but it's uh, to me, the implementation has always been the real hiccup. Wolfgang, I saw your hand raised as well. Yeah, um, I, I would like to um, address uh, David's presentation for, for the moment, because I think this is also absolutely fantastic. For, for about a year or so, I've had on my to-do list for metaphor, create a swirl tutorial or learner tutorial. So thank you. I can scratch one thing off my list. And really, it's, it's, it's really absolutely fantastic. Um, I was wondering, um, how easy is it to take what you have set up and sort of plug in a different data set into, into sort of the, the learner tutorial you have created? That's my first question. And the other one, um, I believe at the moment you're not using this in terms of grading or anything like this in terms of quizzes. This is really like a teaching tool. But have you also considered making this part of like a grading type of uh, system where you can also give people quizzes that they're graded on? We cannot hear. Okay, yeah. Can't hear um, yeah, regarding your first question, it shouldn't be too difficult to switch the data set. It only took us uh, a matter of days to get this up and running from the previous script that we had. Um, yeah, so I could see it being quite straightforward to switch it over. Yeah, and I have a question actually for both Wolfgang and, and David, just, you know, in terms of, um, this is from Neil, in terms of thinking about, you know, the resources that, that you both have provided to the community, um, do you think there's a way that we could combine this work to, you know, really vastly scale training and evidence synthesis kind of globally, or how could we maybe do that? Because um, these are great resources, right? But it's thinking about that pipeline about how to, yeah, so I'll let either of you answer. Well, I mean, if I if I may, I can. I mean, if you really want to sort of think about, so if it's not so difficult to to sort of swap out the data set, you could almost like sort of imagine a system where the user can choose a data set out of the data sets, for example, a metadata, 
And dynamically, the, the learner to toll is then created using that particular data set. I mean, that would take quite some effort to really like automate this process. And of course, the types of issues and methods that you can sort of illustrate with the different data sets will differ. But I mean, that would be that would be like fantastic, right? Like choose one of these data sets that you are really interested in learning more about, right? That becomes more motivating if it's a data set that you are actually really interested in. And then automatically a sort of learner tutorial is created on the fly tuned to that data set. I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I see, Alexander, you have your... Yeah, no, that would be really cool. Um, I can definitely see, uh, yeah, many potential uh, avenues for um, collaboration in the future, creating a modular shiny app where these learner um, components are integrated so that, you know, depending on what the effect measure is, depending on what the heterogeneity investigation is, like subgroup or meta reg, those kinds of things that that could be um, really cool. And to make it um, to make it more accessible, I think our um, app is um, obviously for teaching preclinical um, animal systematic review. Um, so a lot of the information um, is is uh, yeah specific um, to that. Um, but yeah, we use a published um, data set as an example, so people can recreate the the um, analyses from that. Um, on that note, Wolfgang, I wanted to ask if we could um, add a new effect measure to your metaphor package, the normalized mean difference. Uh, <laughs> then we wouldn't need to hard code it ourselves and we could um, use it straight from your package, but we can talk about more, that more later. Well, I'll just get in touch. I mean, uh, happy to, to hear what you have in mind, so yeah. Thanks, everybody. I'm just um, double checking about any um, any questions that are coming in through the through the chat. Um, so, uh, Kira had a, had a question um, regarding um, use of pulling data sets into Metaphor automatically. If um, if if we would ever be able to kind of reach that, like data that's published um, from preprint servers in kind of into um, this system. I don't, I don't know if that's a possibility. <laughs> Maybe a question for Wolfgang, but Mark is shaking his head. Yes, so <laughs> you're saying that would be ideal, Mark. <laughs> I don't, I, I should not answer this. I don't think I could do that, but uh, Wolfgang might. <laughs> Well, I mean, you can, if you have a, a CSV file or whatever lying somewhere in OSF, I mean, you can, that's one command to read it in. And, uh, but, but if you want a data set properly in metadata, you really need to document the data set, right? So um, that's, that's really the, the, the kind of the, the more tedious thing that you have to really create a code book uh, for every variable in the data set, but, but that's, the, that's the sort of formality that we really want. We want well-documented, well-described data sets, right? So um, it's easy to just read in some data, but then you're looking at 50 variables that you have no idea what they mean, right? So there's a little bit of extra effort involved there, yes. And, and the next step from that is um, having these file formats for meta-analysis data sets as a standard for any publishing. Um, so yeah, future, future goals that there is this documentation and metadata for all data sets so that we can use the same code scripts for those dreams. Because when you, when you integrate a data set in your package, you're the, you're the one who's doing all the consistency and formatting, right? Or you get help, right? I, I hope people supply really the data set, the data preparation script that turns that into this R data file and this help file, right? Um, and if even if you don't know how to write our help files, there's the prep that function that sets up the template. It even looks at the data set, figure, figures out what are the variables in the data set. Are they numeric? Are they character variables? Yeah, so yeah. it sets that all up for you. 
And then you just need to complete the description of each variable. And of course the title, and you need to add the reference and so on. But I mean, that's just copy paste from another example and then just adjust, right? I mean, it's, it, it's not super complicated, but yeah, I do, or, or my collaborators, we, we do want to take a look at, at these submissions, right? So to make sure that they are well described and clear and, and so, but yeah, we will be happy to work with you on that. If you have a data set and you just need help getting it into Metadat, just get in touch and, and we, can, we can get you started. That's a great offer. And I, I think um, one of the things that, um, that I find so helpful about your, your work that have for training of folks and learning and it can be used for those trainers of of people um that are learning i mean i i could actually um see um you know someone like mark maybe having if he had a group of students who he felt like were a little bit more advanced starting to use your metadata like creating a data file from that systematic structure and then using that as a teachable moment to say okay maybe you got it wrong here but this is actually these are the elements that we're looking for to have kind of transparent and open science and and this is why this is important so all these tools i see kind of fitting together to to help you know develop this um larger evidence synthesis community. yeah that's like a really important learning outcome is annotating data sets right for reuse it, it's uh surprising how many things are floating out there with little or no information and you're kind of left to figure it out um, and that's why this is so important to have these packages because that is has been filtered, reviewed in a consistent way. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Alex, I thought I saw your hand go up, but maybe I was a minute ago. Maybe I was wrong. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure that um, the questions coming in from Twitter were also being um, is, are there more questions from Twitter at the moment or do we have time? I don't see any here. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, Wolfgang and, and Mark um, if you your experiences with teaching R and I guess R packages to, yeah, to a wide range of audiences, is there kind of help material that you feel is better for students at different stages or, um, yeah, how can we... Um, I guess, optimize the learner experience for either people that are new to, like we want to teach meta-analysis, but they're new to R, or they know R, but they're new to meta-analysis. Do you have any experience of if those groups of students maybe approach things in a different way? Good question. Um... Yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one. So, um, I mean, I, I teach a lot of meta-analysis courses right but um and and there i do not really assume that people have a lot of our experience so i focus on just sort of the the minimal part about r necessary to really get started with meta-analyses of course having some background with r is super helpful um and and that tends to be actually sort of the audience that i have so um people who really do not have a lot of R background and then just really want to learn how to, to run their meta-analyses with R. Um, and yeah, while well, there you, you just have to, in my experience, what you have to do then is really minimize the R code, right? Like, so one of the, for example, like with, with metaphor, you can create forest plots. But if you want that forest plot to look nice, it's it's like three pages of code, right? I mean, I'm, I openly admit that this is how it is in metaphor, right? And um, so, okay, maybe, so I don't focus on that because it's just going to be total overload on all these nitty gritty details of how to create nice figures with R. Right, so I I sort of show them the basic one, and and just show them in principle. Yes, you can customize this to not look so ugly, um, but um, yeah, you have to you have to tune your teaching to like the audience. That's super important. 
but yeah beyond that it's it's hard for me to say like yeah if you have people who are super experienced with r like how i would approach that i don't know if if anybody else has any ideas i've i've tried to do it where the there's like multiple learning outcomes in the course where you start learning r um then you learn stats then you do the two and then you move to meta-analysis. And I feel like nobody walks away knowing anything <laughs> with that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they could learn, maybe they don't know how to tinker with R, but it's just too much all at once. And if you could separate those learning outcomes, I think uh, uh, students' motivations increase because they don't have so many giant benchmarks or hurdles to learn to achieve to understand the next level. And I had, I, again, I say that I totally, I'm very unsuccessful in doing that. And I try to keep those things isolated. So I wish there was like this universal course you could take where you learn stats, you learn R, you learn meta-analysis, you learn reporting. Um, but that's just a lot. <laughs> that's like a multi-year course, <laughs> maybe. It, it probably would be. Um... And unfortunately, on that note, I am going to have to end the session. We're out of time, um, but I want to thank all our, our panelists, presenters. Um, thanks for a great discussion and for sharing your, your really valuable work with, with us and with the larger audience. Um, I want to remind everyone that the session closing, the conference closing today will be um, at 2 p.m. Uh, GMT. So it's in about a half hour. So we look forward to seeing you all then. And, and thanks for participating. <laughs>